just Salado regular board of aldermen meeting, Salado Municipal Building, 301 North States Coast, Salado, Texas. Today is February the 7th, 2019. May the minutes reflect that it is exactly 6.30 p.m. This is the call to order. The secretary, would you please call the order? Here. 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 Thank you for our community. And we've got people in it who are ill and sick. And we ask that you be with them. And there are people here who've lost loved ones. May they know they don't walk this journey alone, that we walk with them. We have a lot of things on the agenda that comes before us. Give us clear thinking. Wise decisions. A sense of humor, and yet a sense of importance and sincerity. Help us, Lord, because you have given us a tremendously <coughs> community, and we're appreciative. Help us to keep it that way. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God. issues and items of concern <coughs> not on the agenda. Those wishing to speak must sign in before the meeting begins and observe a three minute time limit when addressing the board speakers. We'll have one opportunity to speak during the time period. Speakers desiring to speak on an agenda item will be allowed to speak when the agenda item is called. Inquiries about matters not listed on the agenda will either be directed to the staff or placed on a future agenda for alderman consideration. We're very serious about the three minutes, especially tonight when we have so many, but we really try hard to keep it at that. And the second thing, as you come to speak, you're really not speaking to the audience what you're speaking to is to us. 
you're telling us your opinion. And you, if you've never gone through one of these, let me just share with you, we will not respond to anything you say. We can't. But you'll see us taking notes. And somewhere down the line, maybe not in this meeting, maybe in the one that comes up, you will hear us address what you're speaking about. Just want you to know that we take all of this seriously, and we do not take what you say for granted. Therefore, let us begin. Mr. Thomas Moore. When you come, sir, please, uh, your name and your address. <coughs> cold going on. Thomas Moore, 1612 Green Lane. Uh, what I wanted to talk about was the uh, public hearing item on the golf course. I understand that you had a special meeting on the 5th uh, to discuss that. Uh, my concern is, uh, well, first of all, it was a win because I think you've done the right thing. My concern is um, I knew nothing of that meeting. It wasn't posted on the calendar. It is posted on the front of the building, but I don't come down here every day, so I did not see it. Um, the optics, or what someone like me would view that as, is you doing something that may be considered a little bit underhanded or behind the scenes. If it's a legal issue, I can understand going into a closed session but the reason why we have public hearings is so that the public can hear what the conversation is. The public can also comment to that. So my concern is that we're doing this and we're doing it in what I would consider kind of out of order. I do have some experience in working with the city in Bell County. Uh, and I just see that that being a little bit out of order and us citizens not being able to hear all the conversation that could be, whether it's legal or not. I will <coughs> discuss this with the village administrator at a later date. Thank you. You're welcome. And Mayor, for the record, the agenda was posted on the calendar. It comes down after the meeting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ron. I will not call upon you, but thank you for your I gave the 
announcement is because some people may not want to sit through all of this. And right. I, I understand. It was just that um, I just want to make sure I'm court of order that I have understood I can speak now. Otherwise, I don't think I'd be able to speak. You're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Stalker, 2025 Indian Trail, Salado. We'd like to talk to you and mention a few things concerning the additional or approximately 54 acres concerning the uh, easement on uh, Smith Ranch <coughs> between the, the gravel part and the uh, part that is currently paved. The paved part, I can understand. It may be that the gravel could be classified as a in, uh, implied easement, uh, and that's what I'm concerned about. There's a number of us on that gravel access that we use for trailers, RVs, uh, boats, things of that nature. I also know that the uh, fire department has commented about using that road as a barrier concerning <coughs> fires because of the amount of acreage behind uh, in that roughly 500 acres there that the 54 acres is part of and the residence itself. The fire hydrants are approximately a thousand feet apart with that fire barrier. They are able to control the fire without it reaching the homes or the eight foot fences behind those homes. I'd like for you to consider that, please, in your future decision. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mark Rice. So I'm coming up six foot nine. I'm Judy Fields, 18 Blaylock Circle, Salado, Texas, and I am presently the president of the Salado Historical Society. Santa Fe and Albuquerque, which city is the capital of New Mexico. During the 20th century, each was given the opportunity to build either the state prison or an airport. Santa Fe chose the prison for philosophical reason as it would provide the most jobs and show the world it was a humanitarian city. Albuquerque quickly took advantage of gaining the airport and became one of the most popular tourism attractions because of the ease of traveling. This was in the late 1920s. Why am I bringing up this subject? The City Council of Santa Fe failed to project the economic development would, would bring, that would occur in the future with a new method of transportation bringing people to their city, airplanes. However, they were wise enough to realize that they must make changes that would enhance Santa Fe's attraction as a destination point, mainly by preserving the history of the area. Strict ordinances were passed that would require buildings and residences to maintain the allure and mystery of the architecture of the native American Navajo Indians. 
All buildings currently must have the Pueblo style as well as landscaping that utilizes water and vegetation conversation, conservation and environment. <coughs> Interior decorations are at the uh, choice of the owners. By maintaining its historical preservation, the City Council of his Santa Fe has kept its historical district as well as created a unique environment that encourages keeping their history. Santa Fe is now a renowned <coughs> art colony, having attracted not only famous artists who live there, but paint the unique, the allure and mystique of the desert, encouraging visitors and commerce. Salio has a rare opportunity to follow in the steps of such communities as Santa Fe to preserve its history by strengthening such ordinances that would keep our village as a destination point, both for its history, shops, and artists. The Salado Historical Society is dedicated to working with the village aldermen and any current and future businesses in maintaining and preserving our valuable buildings and attractions. We are asking that the aldermen take this into consideration when you're giving uh, proposals by the PNZ and help us to maintain this historic district. We are running into some problems already and we really appreciate the PNZ because they have uh, exhibited very supportive comments on keeping this historic. And that's why Salado's here anyway. People love Salado for its ambiance and its history. Few people realize Main Street was the trail to go north on the cattle drive. It was one of the original, original Chisholm trails. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Set agenda. Yes, sir, second. Second. Motion's been made and second discussion. Question, question has been called. All in favor, raise your hand, please. Post lock box. Pass the Status report. Status report. Yes, sir. Uh, Don, Mayor, Mayor. Don, before you begin, um, I think it would be very important to address the executive meeting that we had and what we did in that, not what the subject well subject was, but who were we talking to? Uh, we were in consultation with the city's legal counsel. So that was the reason it was an executive session. Uh, lawyers typically don't provide advice in public. Mayor, uh, members of the board, let me uh, very quickly go through a number of items. We have a number of reports. First of all, status report on the wastewater project. Um, Today was kind of one of those milestone days in the project. Uh, as, as we have completed construction, we uh, tested the two lift stations. Uh, and we found no major operational issues during that test. Uh, the crews are gonna be installing some landscaping around those lift stations uh, to make them maybe a little bit more uh, appealing to the eye. Uh, crews are also expected to wrap up construction on the wastewater treatment plant this month. Currently, uh, they're working on the fence installation, which is a pretty substantial fence that's being put around the plant site itself. Uh, it's a TCQ required sense, and then they're also finishing work on the plant's electrical system. As you know, later at this meeting, you'll be considering the selection of a contractor to operate the wastewater system. Uh, the second meeting, uh, potential wastewater customers, was held earlier this week. Uh, about 70 people in attendance. Uh, we're going to be forcing some information to the customers uh, via mail and email over the next few weeks. Uh, and we may even have another meeting before we get to the point of collection, but the meeting went really well. There was some <coughs> information sharing that took place in here. Uh, the board will be asked to authorize construction of wastewater lines at the Salento ISD schools uh, at the next meeting on February the 21st. I mentioned the fact that we tested the lift stations today, and I want to show you a few pictures of, 
to give you an idea of how things uh, looked and how things went. Uh, this is the Church Street lift station to give you an inside look. And uh, the way we started the test was we simply pulled up to the manhole and started filling the manhole full of water. Uh, and of course that water worked its way into the lift station itself. And you can see how it fills up. And then we activate it and begin the pumping process. And this is water that basically went from the Church Street lift station and it pushed its way all the way to the Royal Street lift station. A comparable test was conducted with the Royal Street lift station in which we forced that water uphill without problem uh, to the treatment plant. Uh, the interesting thing about it, you can see the, uh, the tank after we finish the pumping process of Church Street. The system itself is a monitor 24-7 through what's called SCADA. So it's an electronic monitoring system. As you know, we have a wireless communication system we install as opposed to, as opposed to a radio transmission system. The original plans had called for actually the construction of a radio tower at the lift stations, uh, which we felt was probably not the most attractive thing downtown. So we're wireless from that standpoint. But we have this SCADA monitoring system. And this SCADA monitoring system, as you can see in this particular slide, this is an example of the screen, this is a screenshot from today's test as we were working on the Church Street lift station. And it actually monitors real-time data, the fluid coming in, and it monitors the real-time data when the pump's activated and what's going out, the rates, those type of things. It produces trends, it can give you an idea and a complete analysis of what's going on. When it gets to the treatment plant, this is an even more fascinating screenshot. And literally, this is the treatment plant from an aerial view that looks down and we monitor every piece of this treatment plant with this electronic system. So this will be a, a monitoring system that we will have in place here, but it's also one that our operator will have uh, available to them 24-7 to monitor any type of situations. The system is set up with an alarm system. Uh, we have backup pumps. We have backup floats, uh, you know, from the from, uh, standpoint of monitoring. So uh, I, I think it's going to be a, a really good system. It really is a state-of-the-art wastewater system. And this with the contractors today, it was quite a coordination effort to get everybody together for that. But everything really did go very well. We've got some recalibration we need to do on some of the flow meters. But just thought you might be interested in some, seeing some of those pictures. Again, we will be scheduling a tour uh, for the board to uh, go see before we get to the point of completion on the plant. Uh, and then, of course, we're planning to have a public open house and, and a ribbon cutting uh, when we're ready to do the first flush, if you will. Status report on Old Mill and Arrowhead intersections. Uh, groundwater has become a problem. As you know, as a result of all the rain we had uh, over the fall and even during the summer months, uh, we, we've had some significant groundwater punches in this particular area. Uh, probably one of the most noticeable one we've had in the neighborhood so far is the one at the intersection of Old Mill and Arrowhead. Uh, you see where there's been some asphalt failure uh, on the north side of, of Old Mill, uh, and it's dry around that area, but if you get out or start walking <coughs> around, you'll realize it's extremely wet totally around that area. Uh, that yard, particularly to the south of, Arrow, uh, to, of Old Mill at Arrowhead, has had close to a half an inch to three quarters of an inch of water across the yard for several months. Uh, and that is, that is not a water leak from the Water Supply Corporation. It's been tested. There's no chlorine residual. Uh, it literally is groundwater that's pushing through. It's pushing through and it's washing out base underneath the roadway, and it's also damaging the asphalt. Uh, so in the coming days, the next few days, probably early next week, we'll have contractors in place, and they're going to go in there and install a French drain system. And that French drain system will be an L French drain that we'll install at Arrowhead and Old Mill. And we're going to try to capture the water from going under Old Mill to the west of that intersection. And then we're going to go down Arrowhead to the south and try to capture that water. All of that to try to catch it before it gets to the roadway. We're not getting on the private property. We're in the right of way. Our concern at this stage of the game is preserving what's left of the roadway. Uh, then what we'll do is we'll come in and we'll pull back the asphalt, let it dry. There will be some closure time on that intersection while it dries out. And once we get the base in a situation that we're comfortable putting asphalt back on, we'll go back in and, and lay an asphalt <coughs> on it. Um, it, it, it. Groundwater is a problem in this area in general. That, we feel, is probably one of the major culprits over on Salado Plaza Drive, where we've had to spend so much money patching that particular area. Uh, and there are some uh, very expensive solutions to that. Uh, and that's something that we may may at some point have to look at down the road. But uh, I think you're going to see more and more of this the, the wetter and wetter this particular area stays. The problem with these type of situations from a history standpoint is they're, they're like a game of whack-a-mole. And that is you solve this problem and then it pops up over here and then it pops up over here and you find yourself chasing it. Uh, so the best thing to do is spray for maybe a little bit drier weather uh, so, so we have some opportunity for things to settle down a little bit. It's always great though to have a, a good source of a good amount of groundwater. Uh, the thing to keep in mind also is the fact that this is evidence of the fact that it's not a problem that's restricted to down at the bottom of the hill or the side of the hill because probably two of the biggest problems we face with, you know, at the wastewater treatment plant, 
we had to approve a contract amendment to go in and deal with the groundwater flow we had up there. We actually had a, almost a small creek that was flowing. Uh, you know, the interesting thing is both of the big problems we've had have been at the top of the hill uh, and not down at the bottom. So uh, kind of interesting to look at that we're going to be working on that. That estimated <laughs> cost is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of eighteen to $20,000 going to fix that intersection. That, of course, will come out of our, our road budget. Status report on the Salado Police Chief search. Uh, we, as you know, closed the window of opportunity for applicants uh, just a few, well, probably about 10 days ago. Uh, about 30 applications were received, a little under that. Uh, the applications have been thoroughly reviewed. Uh, preliminary interviews have been uh, completed. Uh, about five candidates will be going through an assessment center. We're anticipating that assessment center will take place a week from Tuesday. And then a new chief will be selected from the assessment center. As you know, Sergeant Matt Hicks is uh, still in command of the police department and is doing an outstanding job of uh, keeping the groups going and then trying to keep the streets safe from that standpoint. We appreciate what he's doing. I will tell you this as far as the thoughts, as far as the applicant load that we've seen so far, uh, and, and I'm extremely pleased with the quality of the applicants that we see, you know, in this particular city search. I, it was not what I was anticipating. I knew we were going to see some good ones, but the, the volume of quality applications, uh, I think, says a lot about this city and a lot about the desire to come to this city and to help this city. Uh, I think you're going to be pleased when you see uh, when we see when we get down to the finals and get to the selection of a chief, which hopefully will take place uh, later this month. Status report on the uh, May 2019 election. Uh, the filing period, as you may be well aware, is, is open for individuals interested in seeking a place on the Salado Board of Aldermen. Uh, the deadline to file for a place on the ballot is 5 o'clock next Friday, the 15th. Uh, so 5 o'clock next Friday. Uh, you can pick up a packet either here at City Hall or you can pick up an electronic copy here at City Hall or you can go online and download it. My strong suggestion is come by and pick up a hard copy from City Hall and use our paper and use our ink because I guarantee you, you'll be going to Best Buy to get some new printer ink. It's a, it's a thick packet, but it's important information in it that we encourage all of the candidates to look at. As you know, we've got three seats that are up in this upcoming election. Early voting uh, will begin on Monday, April the 22nd. Uh, and it will end on Tuesday, April the 30th. Uh, as you know, we'll be doing the early voting over at the Civic Center. Uh, In-person voting will take place at the Civic Center, both for early voting as well as on Election Day. And of course, Election Day is on May the 4th. Status report on municipal bond, excuse me, municipal building audio improvements. Uh, we're talking about the City Council improvements, Mayor, that you mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago. Uh, this sound system is we workshop that is in need of uh, some significant improvements. Uh, we've had some citizens who have stepped up to the plate to offer to help the city cover some of those costs with about $2,000. We've talked about matching that and, and going out and also finding some additional money to do even more. Uh, the improvements we're talking about basically are, are looking at going in and putting in a new amplifier, uh, some microphones, speakers, and some wireless earpieces uh, to help folks out in the audience who may not be able to hear if they're sitting in the back of the room and the speakers aren't working real well. Uh, the estimated cost of the improvements, $10,000 plus. Um, we have uh, been looking for outside grant sources. As you know, some citizens indicated there were some available. Uh, and I think some of those efforts at this stage of the game have, have not uh, found uh, the grant locations that we are looking for. So we're continuing our efforts to see if there's some additional grant money out there. Um, if not, I think what we're looking at doing probably in the next couple of weeks is, is breaking the project into phases and going through the process of, of maybe buying the first phase and just working our way through. And we're gonna continue the search for grant funding sources. Uh, as we try to improve the audio system in this building to help people out. Staff's report on the comprehensive plan. The comprehensive plan update committee uh, wrapped up its work on uh, the first ever review of the comprehensive plan last week. I see Kathy Seams breathing a sigh of relief. She and her members <coughs> were tirelessly, uh, Frank, which is the same, were tirelessly uh, for a couple of months every Tuesday. Uh, and they finished their work last week. Uh, they've recommended several improvements, and uh, the recommended improvements to the plan will be presented at a joint meeting of uh, that committee, the Planning and Zoning Commission, and the Board of Aldermen. That joint workshop will take place uh, next week on the 11th at 5.30 p.m. right here at City Hall. Uh, at that point, we will unveil the recommendations to the, the three bodies and, and give them an opportunity to discuss and hear the thought process behind those recommendations. From that point, there's an approval process that, that we'll then proceed with. They'll take those amendments that have been recommended by the committee, today meaning the PNZ and the board, and the PNZ will get its first stab at it, and they will hold a public hearing, and then they will consider those amendments and any additional they would like to make, and then forward those on to the Board of Aldermen, and the Board of Aldermen will then uh, consider the amendments, hold a public hearing on those, and make final action. It's gonna be board approval uh, that will uh, basically indicate when the amendments are made to that plan. So uh, we'll post all of that information online as the process progresses. So. Uh, 
Again, we'd like to thank members of the committee for the time. It literally was a three or four month process and an awful lot of time went into it. This is the city's first uh, review of the comprehensive plan. Status report on the Main Street Improvement Project. As you know, bids were open this week on the Main Street Improvement Project. We indicated that was gonna happen a few weeks ago. Uh, the planned improvements include construction of sidewalks on both sides of Main Street, installation of decorative street lighting, drainage improvements, installation of bike lanes, and also some parking enhancements downtown. Uh, the preliminary cost estimates from Techstop put the project cost at about $4.1 million. Uh, when they opened the bids, the low bid came in at about $5.2 million. So they're about a million over what their projected cost was. Uh, Techstop has indicated need not panic. They want to go through the bids and look through those. Uh, they're very pleased with the quality of contractors, which I think is important. Uh, they're very pleased with the quality of contractors who chose to submit, and uh, they will be reviewing those bids and then kind of going through those and combing through those over the next few days to see uh, how they want to proceed. They'll also be looking at their funding sources. As you know, this is a project that is funded with money from uh, the MPO, but also directly from Textile. Uh, and so we're hopeful that uh, we will see some work soon on that project. Beginning, we'll keep you updated on the timeline. Uh, status report on sales tax collections. Just wanted to let you know very briefly uh, that we received our February check. We'll have a complete report on sales tax at the next meeting, but we received our February check uh, yesterday. Uh, that check representing December sales. Uh, it, totaled, it totaled some $52,809.21, uh, which is up about 7%. So no, that's still, that's still so I said we'll have a complete report on that at the next meeting. But uh, we're up 7%, which I think is good. This is actually not typically our highest month. As we talked about this at the, the last meeting, our January check normally is our largest check. Uh, so good news as far as sales tax goes, as we saw some pretty significant growth here in the holiday season. But that's all we've got, Mayor. Oh my goodness, that's a lot. Just a couple of things I want to say. Number one, the water situation we were talking about was coming up through the asphalt. I didn't realize that, but there truly is water that comes up. I know Table Rock called me one day and went over there and looked, and, and Ricky Preston and his people came over and looked, and the stream was just bubbling up underneath it. So you're exactly right about that. Um, I do want to also ask you about um, wastewater project update. It's working, right? <coughs> it's working, right? Uh, it, it, that which we've tested so far is working, and it's flowing uphill. <coughs> and I wanted to hear you say that one more time. It's flowing uphill. Well, that too. But we also wanted... But no, as we all know, it also flows down. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to give you a compliment, <laughs> but it, 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 it's working. Uh, and then I will tell you, uh, to give people a, little, a few facts, uh, you know, it, it took from a standpoint of running the running the, the waste from this lift station, the Church Street to Royal Street, it took about 20 minutes to get there, and it took about 52 minutes to hit the treatment plant uh, for Royal Street. <coughs> Let me give you an idea. So uh, it, it worked well, and like I said, we were doing some recalibration. Uh, the beautiful thing about it is we're going to be able to monitor it. it, it it's going to be pretty darn special. One more time. It works, right? It does work. Okay. Every now and then, maybe more than every now and then, there's a rumor who says, oh, they're tricking you. It is not working, and it never will work. Don, is it working? Okay, that's good. I just want to make that public clear as we go here. We're about ready to get a new police chief, and Matt's been doing it. Matt's been doing a tremendous job. He has? He has. Matt, come give me a report. All right. Way more people here than last time. <laughs> They all wanted to come in here and report. I don't like this public speaking stuff. All right. Yeah, that's pretty powerful. Are we going to start with, you want to start with that first? I'm going to do the monthly report first. I'll do monthly report. Okay. Uh, real quick for the monthly report. Good afternoon, everybody. So this month we had a little bit of drop in calls for service. We had 425. It only dropped from 487, so not a huge drop. Uh, written reports went way up. Uh, we were busy. We took 29 uh, written reports. We had 12 in December. 
Uh, citations were 94, warnings 221. Our arrest went up again this month. We had 10. Last month we had six. Uh, wide range of stuff. Uh, response times, our priority one dropped again. Our response times on average were two minutes and eight seconds to a priority one call. Uh, the priority two calls, they increased probably due to the 27 traffic accidents at the beginning of the month. It <coughs> uh, was three minutes and 58 seconds. It's still not terrible. And our priority three calls response times dropped as well with five minutes and three seconds. Uh, for the COPS activities that I have this month, we had 12 total shifts, eight days recovered, 24 total hours, and they found four open doors. Um, I think Mr. Ferguson, I want to go over some stuff with the COPS unit real quick? Sure. Uh, we met, Matt and I met the other day with the, with the COPS organization, which, which again, I think both of us would, would say how much we appreciate their volunteer efforts and, and the time that they put in. It's, it's, it's an amazing group of people. One of the things they've asked for is they've asked for an expansion of duties. And so we have worked together and come up with uh, a couple of projects that they might be able to do other than the normal door shaking that they do and uh, kind of the, the eye watching downtown at night and those type of things. And they're working and they're going to be talking a little bit more about the details of a program uh, that is a program that's intended to try to help prevent auto theft. Um, you may recall a few years ago, the state of Texas had a program called HEAT, uh, which was an acronym for Health End Auto Theft, H-E-A-T. And basically it's a program that involved the marking of your vehicle and if that vehicle was found on the streets uh, after a certain hour at night uh, it basically you signed a sheet of paper when you entered for the program basically authorizing law enforcement to stop your vehicle to find out who's driving it and to make sure it's supposed to be out on the street and it's being uh, driven properly by, by somebody who's supposed to be driving so uh, the state had that program and, and it, it ran it ran its course and they dis disbanded it a couple of years ago, but it's a program that I think we're going to try to resurrect in Salado, uh, to be specific to Salado, and we're going to we're going to try to encourage the, the cops organization to participate and, and kind of launch that program. Uh, Mr. Nathanson and I met this week, and uh, he's going to be presenting more information to the group as a whole uh, to basically work on a formal adoption and implementation program. But the way it would work is they would have registration events, like regular registration events, but also at special activities, be it stroll. Be it, you know, activities at Brookshire's or whatever, or where there are community gatherings and school activities, those type of things, where they would encourage people to register their vehicles. Uh, and if that vehicle is found on the streets of Salado, you know, by our police officers, uh, we're going to walk and see if, if we can get the constable to participate in it too. That uh, if the vehicle is found on the street and they've noticed the sticker that gives them the ability to stop the vehicle just to check on it to make sure everything's okay and to make sure everything's in order and the right person's driving the vehicle. Uh, it's a great program. It's an easy program to implement, uh, and we think in this type of community, it would be a big success because this community is very active and involved in incident prevention. So we thought we'd let you know what's coming down, and you'll be hearing more hopefully from Mr. Nathanson. We'll get him to come and make a presentation when they get to that point. Uh, real quick, other news of the police department: our long guns are purchased and fully equipped. Thank you all very much. Uh, we are all qualified, uh, and they are on each vehicle. So if bad stuff happens, we have them right there at our leisure. Um, of course, we still have our rifle resistant vests and stuff like that. Um, Officer Dutchie has completed his caliber press training class in San Antonio. Thank you for sending him to that. It was a two-day seminar. Very great for uh, new officers, especially in street survival. Um, it's a huge reminder in the safety aspects and a couple different training points for him. Uh, so the next thing we've got to do, what everybody loves in police work, is the uh, racial profiling and the UCR reports. Uh, so it's required reporting under the state of Texas uh, for racial profiling. We, have to uh, we report every single motor vehicle stop, uh, not just traffic stops. Um, so if it's suspicious vehicle stuff like that, we report it. Uh, any and all stops under the law resulting in warning citations and or arrest uh, is tracked by races, uh, identified by the state of Texas and by statute. Uh, we report searches conducted during the stop, if we do them or not. Uh, it must be reported by the race if it's known prior to the stop. That's a huge thing. Uh, <coughs> those reports are due by the 1st of March. And I can tell you I submitted it to T. Cole today and they accepted my report, so we are compliant for one more year. No funds. Um, oh, one more, one more back. I got UCR. Uh, UCR is Uniform Crime Reporting. Uh, we do a state level, and then the FBI kind of changes some titles. They're kind of funky with their titles. But offenses are uh, every offense that is taken by law enforcement that fits into the category is put into the UCR, not only arrest. Um, 
separated into 31 main categories, and there's a couple subcategories under there. It's, it's a lot. Uh, required to report by the seventh day of each month. That was completed last night, so that's completed as well. Uh, submitted to the Texas DPS Uniform Crime Reporting. Uh, we moved to a system called NIVERS uh, that y'all probably heard of a couple months back that we got approved for the grant funding for that through the state of Texas. It's, it's a whole lot easier to do it that way. And then the FBI also uses those numbers for statistics uh, nationwide. So racial profiling for 2018, we conducted a total of 1,687 stops. We issued 687 citations, 922 warnings, and 78 arrests out of those traffic stops. Um, searches, we searched a total of 88 cars. Uh, 24 of that was on consent. 53% was probable cause uh, developed by the officer. Uh, 11 was other. Other falls into inventory of arrest, uh, stuff like that. Uh, contraband found 58. So out of those 88 stops, 58, 58 times contraband was located. 43 of those uh, searches, narcotics or drug equipment was located, four times weapons, six times was alcohol, and uh, other is um, would fall to like um, money or just random, random stuff. So this is, uh, Mr. Ferguson wanted me to present a little bit of a comparison between last year and this year. As you can see, our, our, our traffic stops went up pretty good. Uh, our citations rose, our warnings also rose, uh, rose quite a bit, and our arrests also went up as well. So it was kind of a busy year for us compared to last year. Uh, our searches, they stayed about the same. Uh, not really surprised by it at all. Uh, contraband located went down by one. Um, consent, all that to see, no red flags or anything with that. Uh, probable cause is still there, others still there. Uh, so racial profiling by race in 2018. So out of our numbers uh, for the um, Hispanics, written and citations for the warnings and stuff, uh, 262. So that's 15% of our stops, we stop Hispanics. Uh, white Caucasian, uh, 1,231. So 70, almost 73% of our stops, we, we stopped Caucasian and white. 173 or two blacks, that's about almost 11%, 10 and a half. Asians, 18, so right at 1%. Native American, 3, um, that's not even 1%. And other, well, you can usually figure out who they are. And then all together, the, the, the whole number of 1687. So uniform crime reporting, it's also known as UCR um, for 2018. So these are all the offenses and or arrests that were made by the select. So assaults, both family violence and against just a regular person. Uh, oh, I don't know why that floor is supposed to delete it. Sorry, that was last year. So five. We had five reported UCRs. Uh, burglaries, we had eight. Um, drug abuse violations, we had 33 this year. Driving under the influence or DWIs, we are at 30. Uh, forgeries, checks, stuff like that, is at three. Uh, larceny, another fancy word for thefts, are 14. Motor vehicle thefts, we have one this year. Uh, rapes or sexual assaults, we have five this year. And then uh, robberies, we have that one. Sorry about the numbers on the left, I forgot to delete those. So this is uh, this is just a graph comparison last year to this year. So we've had obviously a, just a little bit of an increase in assaults. Um, that happens. Uh, the more we people are educated about family violence, the more <coughs> stuff comes out. Um, so awareness is always there. I, there's a possibility that some of it's going unreported, but that's just the name of the game. Our burglaries have went way down. Uh, we had that rash last year, but they were arrested and prosecuted. Uh, so we had, I think it was eight this year. Uh, drug abuse violations, they went a little bit down, um, but not a, not a major increase, so it's still there. Our DWIs rose, uh, we're at 30. Uh, forgeries went down, thefts went down, motor vehicle theft went down, sexual assaults increased. And then, of course, our robbery, we had that one robbery. He's in jail awaiting prosecution. So uh, stats and contacts. So overall, this is uh, from last year to this year. So every type of contact law enforcement radioed in and called out on, uh, last year was 2479, and this year was 3443. So we had an increased call for service. So that's going to continue to rise. Uh, so in closing, we uh, the Salado Police Department operates in a fair and consistent manner with racial uh, makeup of the community. There's no evidence of racial profiling used by officers to make enforcement decisions. And there was no complaints in 2018 and no evidence of racial profiling. Questions? Matter of fact, it's up 
short and sweet.
So the next thing is uh, events. There's uh, the event calendar starting to fill up a lot. Um, you've got stuff going throughout the weeks, and then you've got your spring events that are coming up. I'm trying to engage with those um, event planners as much as possible. Uh, everything from things with the Chamber of Commerce, uh, things at the brewery, the winery event, um, and, and other things that you're probably aware of. Uh, Texas Rodeo Wine Art Festival, Wildflower Festival uh, are coming up quick, so trying to help them make sure that goes well. Very good. The meeting that I was with, uh, I think, uh, this last week uh, dealt with the historic days, getting ready for uh, June 2nd. 22nd, I mean. Uh, June, I always forget, eight. it's that 7th, 8th, 9th, that weekend. June 8th. I forget the numbers. It is really going to be fantastic. It will already started advertising for the It will be. Yes. Well, nicely done. We don't get an opportunity to, to really ask you a lot of questions. <coughs> Would y'all like to ask him some questions? Well, Chad, when they don't ask questions, that means you're doing it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. hearings and possible action. Hold the public and consider approval of an ordinance of the village of Salado, Texas, changing the zoning from historic district to public facility for approximately 8.44 acres, generally located south and north of Pace Park Road and east of IH 35 also known as Pace Park in Salado, Bell County, Texas, and providing for the following severe ability, effective date, and proper notice and meeting. John? Yes, sir, uh, Mayor, members of the board. Uh, let me start off, first of all, the, the, the next two items on the agenda are what are called zoning cases. And we don't see zoning cases a lot in this community. Uh, it, it, so I thought it would probably be a good educational piece for the board as well as members of the audience to understand what zoning is. And zoning is the city's way of regulating land use uh, and, and determining what is the best, <laughs> best land use uh, for the community via a comprehensive plan, via our master plan. Uh, these decisions that this board makes when it comes down to zone properties are not decisions that are made by their preference. They're decisions that are supposed to be made by taking several things into consideration. Uh, they're serious decisions, they're land use decisions. The thing to also keep in mind about zoning is zoning can change at any time. Just because this board may zone a piece of property something doesn't mean it stays <coughs> that way in perpetuity. It means it can change you know, at any time, uh, via the property owner's request and, or via the city's request. Uh, but uh, it's important to understand that it is not a final say for that property and the history of that property from here on out. Uh, when considering a zoning change, uh, the commission, uh, the board, uh, should consider the following items. Uh, whether the use is permitted by the proposed change will be appropriate in the immediate area concerned and their relationship to the general area and the village as a whole. Whether the proposed change that's being requested is in accord with any existing or proposed plans for providing public schools, street water, supplies, sanitary sewers, or other utilities in the area. Whether the amount of vacant land currently classified for similar development in the vicinity and elsewhere in the village in any special circumstances which may make a substantial part of such vacant land unavailable for development. The recent rate at which the land is being developed in the same zoning classification as the zoning request, particularly in the vicinity of the proposed zoning change. They're also supposed to consider how other areas designated for similar development will be or are unlikely to be affected if the proposed amendment proposed zoning change is approved. And other factors uh, that will substantially affect public health, safety, morals, and general welfare. I think it's important to understand that probably the overriding item in all of these is the comprehensive plan. Cities are required by law to have a master plan. It's called a comprehensive plan. And one of the key pieces of that comprehensive plan is a land use plan. And it basically is, is kind of the city's 
uh, pathway to the future. It's, it's, it's basically uh, our snapshot of how we envision this community developing and how we see this land and this community being used. So it's important when they consider zoning changes that they consider how that zoning change fits into the comprehensive plan. Ideally, cities should try to zone their properties in accordance with their comprehensive plan. And so those are kind of the key factors that you look at in, in the zoning process. In this particular case, this first <laughs> zoning case, we call this case the Pace Park Rezoning Request. As you mentioned, Mayor, it's just over eight acres. It's located along the Salado Creek and within the historic district, generally north and south of Pace Park Road. Uh, the future land use map in the comprehensive plan designates this property as public park. The current zoning designation is historic district. The proposed zoning designation, public facility, PF, uh, which permits public parks. Justification for the rezoning is to zone the property in accordance with the comprehensive plan and to match the property's historic use. Pace Park is a unique piece of property, and Pace Park is a, is a piece of property that for its lifetime will remain a park. Uh, as you know, it, it is basically in a trust. The city is the sole trustee, and we are obligated through court action to keep this park as a public park and operate it as a public park. Uh, our feeling is, our staff's position on this situation is that we need to zone it as such and then classify it as a public facility, uh, as a public park under public facilities uh, and, and keep it that way from, from basically this point on in this situation. Uh, we notified about 20 properties within uh, 200 feet of the area. We received one response against it uh, and it was from uh, Mr. Foster who said that he wanted the city to basically leave businesses and property owners alone. Uh, so we went to the Planning and Zoning Commission. The PNZ had a good discussion. Uh, there were some concerns expressed uh, by some in the audience and by some members of the commission about uh, whether this zoning would impact uh, the historic uh, position of this park, its, its, its role in the historic district, uh, the historic overlay area itself. Uh, we pointed out that it really doesn't. This is a land use designation. Uh, and, and that by taking <coughs> that historic designation away from it, that we're not doing anything as far as taking this property out of the historic overlay. It's just designating its land use as it's been used historically. That said, the commission voted against the zoning uh, and, and recommended denial in this particular case. So it's before you tonight for consideration. Uh, our staff's recommendation continues to be that you, that you zone a public facilities park, public park, and then move forward on that. So it's before you, Mayor, for public hearing and action. Any questions to Don, please, before I'll entertain the motion? Any questions? Don, if, if we leave it uh, like it currently is zoned, uh, what versus uh, making the, uh, the rezoning, exactly what's the difference? What would happen if we leave it? What will happen if we uh, may go ahead and uh, vote to make this zone change? In this particular case, it's always going to be a public park. Uh, but our feeling is this, and that is it's a, it's a park that's operated by the city, by the village, and in the future we plan to develop that particular park. As we develop that particular park, it's important that we go out and seek funding sources. And one of the things that we find when we go to agencies like Texas Parks and Wildlife and some of these other foundations <laughs> that are key contributors to parks is they want to see some type of designation of that as a park, some type of public declaration, uh, and, and, and some type of zoning protection for that is always a way to demonstrate that. So we feel that that's an important reason to do this, in addition to the court position that you need to know that this is a public park and will remain a public park from here on out. So uh, it doesn't change it. I, I stress, and I, and I really want to stress this, and that is there's a, there's a disconnect in our zoning code that we're going to try to correct post-comprehensive plan uh, as far as the amendments that we're fixing to do. And the comprehensive plan calls for a historic overlay. We don't have a historic overlay designated, per se, through ordinance. And that's one of the things you're going to hear in your recommendations at next week's workshop is that we literally go in and implement a, an overlay district, basically designate a historic zoning area by ordinance. What we did was we took what was in the original comprehensive plan, uh, and, and they, instead of creating the overlay, they for some reason created a historic zoning district as far as instead of a historic zoning overlay. This particular piece of property is going to be in the middle of the historic overlay. There are no plans. In fact, the comprehensive plan proposes to widen that proposed boundary for a historic overlay when we create that. So this is going to be in the middle of it, and it's not going to go out of the historic overlay. It's going to remain the historic overlay, and it's an important piece of the historic overlay, especially in this community's history. So, Mayor, 
So if we, if we rezone it, we won't be changing the historic value of this uh, piece of property to our, our village and our heritage. No, sir. It's a land use designation. That's all I have. Other questions, please? I'll entertain the motion, please. hearings work this way here. You will have the opportunity to either speak for or against. You have three minutes. <coughs> I will come out of this session, go into a public hearing session, and I'll ask three times. One, <coughs> does anyone wish to speak? If someone does want to speak, they will come up to the podium and they will speak whatever they want for three minutes. Two, if no one comes, then I go to three. At the end of three, if there are any at that time, then I will close it and we will come back into this meeting. And at that time, we will, I will entertain a motion. So, we're coming out. The time now is 7.30. We're now going into the public hearing. First of all, anyone, anyone who would like to speak? Judith Ells, 818 Blaylock Circle, Salado, Texas. Again, I would ask the board to seriously consider why the PNZ voted no. Don unfortunately didn't explain that. And I would like for you all to understand that we are in support of what the PNZ is recommending, and they're recommending no. <coughs> I'm John Cole, 1420 year old in Salado. In support of the question Mr. Cogan asked, I was at the PNZ meeting a week or so ago, and a lot of people were confused on what the benefit of the change. And I think you need to pour that out a little, a little bit more emphasis on that, because people are still confused. You know, is the park going to be better if we rezone it, or is it not going to be better? Is it going to be better maintained by the city to include Serena Park? I think that's the big question. People just don't know what the benefit of the rezoning is. I think you need to clarify that and we will calm a lot of fears in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jody Lander, 1012 Mill Creek Drive. I spoke at the um, zoning board and I want it to be a park and I don't have a problem with that. I see the purpose of it. I think a lot of us do not want to see it changed until we know that historic overlay is in place to protect it because <laughs> it needs to be a different type of park. Like one of the things they're recommending is the use of the stones and trees to, for the parking as opposed to putting metal barriers out there. We want to make sure that those type of things are maintained now and in the future when the wonderful people who have been taking care of the history of Salado are no longer here. If we don't get a next generation to continue it, we want to make sure that gets preserved. Mayor, I think that was one of the ideas, if I can jump in, that the PNZ had mentioned in their denial was that they were interested in the historic overlay and then maybe coming back and visiting after historic overlay. I will tell you as a point of addition that to, to, to help clarify it and, and hopefully allay some concerns, this board adopted an improvement plan for Pace Park several months ago and intertwined throughout that improvement plan were projects that were intended to display, project, and enhance the educational piece about the history of that park. Uh, so I think the Parks Board presented the board a plan that was very sensitive to that and I think they're dedicated.
first call is coming to an end. Second call for anyone who wishes to speak. Linda Reynolds, 507 Santa Rosa. Uh, I spoke before the planning and zoning. I appreciated that they uh, uh, voted against changing the zoning. Uh, I did, I wasn't against the change. I just wanted in the amend in the ordinance for it to say public facility, if you must, instead of public park, public facility within the historic district. Um, at one point that was added and then it was subtracted. I'm not exactly <laughs> sure why we can't say in the change within the historic district. Is there a difference between a historic district and a historic overlay? As near as I can tell, and this may be confusion, uh, in a historic overlay, you can take land out and develop it in some way and call it and give it a cup and turn it into a commercial. Uh, I, I think I want to understand why we can't say a public uh, facility within the historic district. About 100, or about, uh, uh, I'm reading from Bill Kennison and Maybell uh, Brown, Tim Brown's mom, who's now deceased. Um, that uh, this city began, the village began uh, roughly, some people feel, in October 8, 19, 1859 when Elijah Sterling Clack Robertson donated 100 acres of land. In my mind, being a part of the historic district, that 100 acres is historic land. Uh, generations of Native Americans principally, and I've never heard this Native American before, Tan Tankawa, uh, occupied this area prior to the arrival of settlers from Mexico and the United States. They were flint working, hunting people who came to Salado Creek for the clean water always available and the abundance of flint along the banks. In Pace Park, the Texas Historical Commission recovered Indian artifacts dating to the archaic period, 6000 BC uh, to 500 AD. That's right in our backyard, that's Pace Park. It's somewhat historic. Uh, there are 20 sites with state historical <coughs> markers, including Salado Creek. Not only do we have 100 acres of land that is historical, but we have a creek that is historical by the Texas Natural Landmark, designated by the Texas Historical Society Committee. Texas Historical Commission markers are on, and then all the other properties that are in our ordinance. The land itself is historical, the creek is historical, Pace Park is historical. Let's keep it in the historical district. Put it in the ordinance that way, please. Thank you. Mayor, there'd be no problem putting it within the boundaries of the historic overlay district. I would say historic overlay. Thank you. Thank you. We're still in the second call. Anyone who would like to speak? So I just, I wanted to clarify um, the reason that I voted, I can't speak for the entire commission, but the reason I voted against it was because we have this new <coughs> comprehensive plan coming out 
We have new language with a historic overlay language that doesn't exist yet. I wanted this to go in the order of here's the plan, here's the language. I don't want to put a Band-Aid on these parks and then feel like ripping, ripping it off in two months. Um, that, that'll be embarrassing and it'll be confusing even more for the public. Um, I, I voted against these parks designation right now because I don't know that there is any need to rush. Maybe there is and I don't know. Um, but it made sense to me to create this language going forward, this updated comprehensive plan, which is going to get rid of some of the confusion with the historic district and the other districts, um, and then designate this park as a public facility park that it has always been. Um, that, that was my reason, and if there's a rush, I guess so, but I wanted you to hear it from me, um, that I don't wanna put the cart before the horse. Thank you, Katie. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Tim Flosher, um, 912 Cedar Park Circle. And I'd like to give some, some information on why we have a historic district in our comprehensive plan. Because during the meetings with Duncan Sefco, one of the things that, that the engineer, planning engineer told those committee members was that you did not want spot zoning throughout your town. You didn't want it to look like a polka dotted map of commercial zone here, office zone here, restaurant zone here, so on and so forth. And then put an overlay of a historic overlay on top of a patchwork of, of different zoning districts on individual pieces of property. So he told the group that initially drew up that comprehensive plan to come up with the idea of the historic district and then to offer, then to have many different land uses under that. You would have uh, commercial land uses, uh, the ability to operate bed and breakfasts, the, the ability to have a dentist's office, the ability to have a residence, all these different land uses under the historic district zone and he told us repeatedly to draw to paint zones with big broad paintbrush strokes not polka dots and not checkerboards so he warned us not to spot zone and if you look at our zoning map we don't we don't have a lot of different um, zoning districts or pock marks of them so, and that was following the advice of, of a well-known regional planner that does those things for a living. That's why we have a historic district as a district zoning designation rather than a, hi a historic district overlay with lots of different zoning districts underneath it. Thank you. Mayor, point of clarification, we do not have spot zoning in this city. Spot zoning is a legal term uh, in relation to land use zoning. Uh, what you have is land use zoning. Uh, and, and you have a historic overlay that is called for in the comprehensive plan that doesn't exist. We have historic districts, which is a land use zoning designation. Uh, and we have an overlay that's identified in the comprehensive plan that we do not have in place and protected by the mm -hmm. ordinance at this time. You allow those type of uses that Mr. Flesher pointed out, those are land use designations that are normally established through the creation of zoning districts. Spot zoning is a totally different animal than with reference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. rezoning that property. I just know why, because I covered those meetings, why we drew a historic district 
zoning designation. And spot zoning is a, is a legal definition, and, and the definition of spot zoning is when you zone one piece of property at a time, rather than zoning an area. Could it apply to a large piece of property like eight acres, or a small piece of property like, those are the kind of things that <coughs> end up if you have a contentious zoning issue, perhaps if this zoning were being applied to someone who didn't want their property zoned that way, if you weren't zoning the similar neighbors that way, then that's what <coughs> spot zoning is. Thank you. Yes, um, Charlene Walsh, 1001 Mill Creek Drive. I was a member of the committee who first wrote or put together a comprehensive plan and zoning, and I'd like to support what Tim said. Uh, as well as ex because uh, spot zoning is what we really need to be aware of, of, being careful of. And that is exactly what almost happened uh, when, when the sanctuary zoning questions came up to the PNZ uh, back in uh, 20, uh, was it 2015? The, uh, <coughs> Mr. H Billy Hanks Jr. wanted that 3.12 acres on t right next to college, or the ruins of the first college in Texas. He wanted that zoned commercial. Commercial means you can put a car lot, a drive through a restaurant, a gas station, a welding shop, a garage, whatever. And, and, it is, and that particular piece of property completely surrounded by properties within the historic district, which I believe to be a, the historic overlay, really. And, and Tim is right. Dan Sefko told us all, broad strokes with zoning, give leeway. But he said commercial, commercial is really <coughs> different. Everything in the current uh, historic district is zoned retail, not commercial, not mixed use, uh, not a planned development, it's owned retail, which means you could have a house there, you can have an office there, you can have, uh, you can have a store there, you just, you can have a sit down restaurant, you just can't have a drive through or a gas station. Why? Because nobody on that committee wanted to see the golden arches from Main Street. We wanted to preserve our history. And we are afraid with fast food restaurants, garages, and all the other commercial businesses that go along with that designation, you'd lose it. So, and, and so that is why the PNZ voted unanimously to not zone that 3.12 acres uh, on top of College Hill next to the ruins of the first college in Texas. They, they all they unanimously voted not to rezone that commercial. It would have been spot zoning. They recognized it was totally surrounded by other uses. Uh, by, it was totally sort of in the in historic district and or overlay, and it was uh, commercial use would not be would not would not fit in to any of the uses within retail zoning. So, uh, and spot zoning is illegal. You can look it up. So that's what I have to say. Thank you. If you have any questions, talk to me. Public hearing is closed. The time is 7.48. Mayor, for the record, spot zoning is the application of zoning to a specific parcel or parcels of land within a larger zoned area when the zoning is usually at odds with the city's master plan or current zoning regulations. Your master plan calls those properties parks. So we're trying to zone those properties accordingly <clears throat> and to benefit the city from a standpoint of future funding opportunities. And also to be consistent and to reemphasize a court order. We're not doing spot zone. That's just the definition.
Mr. Mayor, I move to rezone the property known as Pace Park from HD to PF. Is there a second? Alderman Coachman, would you be willing to accept an amendment <coughs> that, that would say with the property remaining within the historic overlay district? I don't think that's appropriate yet, Don. And I'll explain why in a minute. Okay, we've got you. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Now we can have a discussion. Okay, let me see if I can, can clarify some things here. When we started this comprehensive plan review, and I don't know if Jim's still here or <coughs> if he made it tonight, we discovered that there were things that our forefathers did in 2004 when this plan was established that the Board of Aldermen never followed through on. And two of those were the establishment of PF, which uh, public facilities and private facility <coughs> use of land. We did not have those designations within our ordinances or our laws. So at the last couple of meetings, we took care of that. Not to go with the new comprehensive plan, but to address the original comprehensive plan of 2004. So what we're doing is we're actually cleaning up the original plan in order to establish that base to do the new plan, the amended plan. So what we're trying to do is get our public parks in the right place with our original comprehensive plan. So the public use of land is one thing that we did not have in our ordinances. We now have it. So we wanted to now put the parks, the two pieces we're talking about, but we'll do the same thing with the Serena Park. We're trying to put them in the existing comprehensive plan use. So we're doing that cleanup and then we'll come in and we're gonna talk about establishing the overlay district which actually is a little more constringent. It's more protective. It's more protective of the historic district than what we have now. <coughs> so if you go in and look at our zoning districts now, there's a, a small portion of the historic district. It's not that restrictive, what we currently have in law. So the comprehensive plan is we're gonna try to make the historic district more restrictive as to what you can do within the boundary of that. And we are expanding those borders of the historic district and trying to incorporate some other properties around the village that we do feel are historic that are not currently included in that boundary. So all we're doing right now is cleaning up what we already have. That's the point of where we are and why we've created those two new districts to go with what has already been deemed that we're supposed to do by the existing comprehensive plan. So that's what we're trying to, to accomplish tonight. I hope you understand that. Well, and you're going to so. see in the comprehensive plan that you're going to present to them next week, these properties are dead center in the middle of the overlay district that you're proposing to create. Exactly. And the reason why I don't want to put that the wording within the historic district is because we're really going to do away with HD and make it HOD, historic overlay district. So then I think if you want to come back and amend saying within the historic overlay district, it would be appropriate. But the board has not adopted that particular type of zoning yet. <clears throat> So this is my point for doing this. We're trying to clean up what we already have established within the village from 2004, and it hasn't been done in the, what is that, 14 years? Yep. Within that time frame. So we're trying, we're playing catch up here, basically with what our forefathers asked us to do. Thank you. Other discussion, please? Well, my concern is that we're, uh, that we're, we're sort of putting the cart before the horse in that it seems like the logical thing to do would be to uh, complete our com comprehensive plan, get all the zoning uh, identifiers in place, and then go back and look at <coughs> how you would approach uh, rezoning uh, Pace Park. So uh, I would support your uh, your motion if we uh, put it off state till after the comprehensive plan has been looked at and, and adopted. Mr. Cogman, it's already in the comprehensive plan. It's in the existing comprehensive plan. Calls it out as a park. And it's a use that's consistent and has historically been consistent with the area. And also by deed of the property, it's to be operated as a public <coughs> park. <coughs> Other discussion, please. Question has been called. All in favor, raise your hand, please. Opposed, likewise. Passes. Number B. Hold a public hearing and consider approval <coughs> of the ordinance of the village of Salado, Texas. Changing the zoning from historic district HD 
to public facility, PF, for approximately 1.1 acres generally located south of the Salado Creek, north of College Hill Drive, east of IH35, and west of Main Street, more specifically known as Serena Park in Salado, Bell County, Texas, and providing for the following severability, effective date, and proper notice and meeting. John? Uh, yes, sir. Mayor, members of the board, uh, this is your second zoning case tonight. We call this particular case the Serena Park rezoning. Uh, the property description, as you pointed out, was 1.18 acres. Uh, it's located along the Salado Creek and uh, within the historic district north of College Hill Drive, east of IH35, and west of Main Street. I think we all know where it is. It's located basically on the creek right there at the bridge on the, that would be the, what, south west <coughs> of the bridge. A future land use map designates it as public park. That's the future land use map in the comprehensive plan. The current zoning designation is historic district from the original zoning of the properties in that area. Uh, proposed zoning designation is public facilities, which permits public park. Uh, justification for the rezoning uh, is much the same as the other with the exception of the court involvement. Uh, and is to uh, zone the property in accordance with the comprehensive plan, number one, which calls it to be a public park. Uh, number two, to match the historic property use. Uh, from that standpoint, and also to put the city in a position to the point where it has the ability to go out and seek additional funding uh, to help improve and protect that particular park. As I stressed before, much the same as, as, as the previous case, it's smack dab in the middle of what is called for in the comprehensive plan, the historic area, and uh, it, there's no plan to change that. So it's before you for public hearing and consideration. <coughs> P and Z heard the situation. Katie's argument uh, that she presented her side uh, was, was much of what we heard from P and Z. Their motion was to deny the recommendation and maybe reconsider it if the one would create the overlay. Mm -hmm. Questions to Don, please. So in the meantime, that would be denying applications for for uh, monetary assistance. And same thing. It, it's going to impede you from going out and seeking mm -hmm. grant money. I, I can tell you that you know one of the things that that they seek is, is some evidence of the, the fact that the property is dedicated, protected, and public park. And then one of the ways you show that is through zoning. You also show that through the designation of public designation of park. Okay. Thanks. Other questions to Don, please. As I did last time, I'm coming out of this meeting. The time is 7.57. <clears throat> Everything that I said before, you understood and did perfectly well. First call. historical district. 
I think the historical district is more controlling. I think a historical overlay means you can take a piece of property, like the empty land across from the pizza place, and somebody could put a McDonald's there, a mixed use, uh, a car dealership, whatever, because all you have to do is say, oh, this is a better use, and you all will say, yeah, we'll get more taxes if we put a car dealership there. So we're gonna pull that out of the historic district and turn it into commercial. Again, we have yet to resolve the three point something acres that several people on this board, not everybody, but several people on this board agreed to turn into a commercial area. That has never been resolved yet. But as soon as we become an overlay, then I think you could probably take that land out and say, oh, we get to do the 200 feet people around there. Is it okay if we turn that commercial? And maybe they'd be happy to have a commercial. I'm not sure if the historic society would love that. I appreciate Morris Foster, who still owns land in the historic district here, to take note of what you're doing and suggest he is not for it. I appreciated the planning and zoning board voting the way they did. They were careful and thoughtful. And uh, often I've heard people on this very board say, well, if the PNC said, okay, we'll do it. Well, if the planning and zoning says don't do it, I don't understand why we're in a rush to change it. I fear, and I'm hoping I'm wrong, I fear for what you want to do with land in the historical district once it becomes an overlay where you can take it out of the historic district and do other things with it. We need to consider it anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Judy Fields, 818, Blaylock Circle, Salado. I, I don't understand why you're not listening to your planning and zoning board that you all appointed. These people have put serious time and thought into their recommendations, and you really need to listen to them. And you have good arguments back and forth, and you can compromise too. The other thing is, they said no on both of these previous ordinances. Please listen to them. They didn't just do this casually. They take time out of their busy schedules and days to read uh, why it would be the most ad advantageous decision that they're going to recommend to you. The other thing is, how many on this board are members of the Historical Society? And if not, why not? You live in a significantly historic town <coughs> in the state of Texas. We have commercial values, we have destination values, tourism, history that is ongoing. And it would be beneficial for you all to join our society too, to help us give out to the people and what's going on. We support Salado tremendously. By the way, the home tour will be back this Christmas. We've already got it going. Shirley Lett is in charge of it. It's exciting, we're gonna have something a little bit different. We're drawing people into Salado to help appreciate what we've got. And the cabins that we maintain over here is where the majority of our monies and fundraisings go. So if you're not a member of the Historical Society, why not? If you're that interested in the history of this precious, precious village. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. That goes for y'all, too. You can join. <laughs> Ms. Fields, do you think that we do not spend our busy schedule as, as much time as the PNC? Do you think we don't spend any time on it? You're implying that to me, that we don't spend as much time as they do. I that's absolutely, that. well, that's the issue. Yes, you are. No, yes, you my are. husband served on this board for four years. I well know the time, effort, tears, and everything mm -hmm. else, study that mm -hmm. goes in to okay. being a responsible well, I'm glad board. you understand that. I'm sorry? I am glad you understand that. You you know I will understand it. And he was very dedicated to this. I'm not talking well. about your husband, your late husband. I'm talking about so I'm glad you understand it. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Why do you think we moved here? I have no clue. Okay. But I will understand everything, all the effort mm -hmm. and time. Okay. Anybody that serves on any board, whether it's the PALS board, 
this historical society board, the Lions Club, the Rotary Club, this takes time and effort to make the success of these organizations. Mm -hmm. And I understand that. Good. And I hope you understand that I understand that. Thank you. Thank you. Third and final call for anyone who would like to speak. I'm going to clarify something. Don is exactly right. It's not spot zone. But one of the things that the, uh, the, the that the planner told us to avoid was was to have a checkered board. So I'm sorry I used that legal term term because it is a very legal contentious term. This is not an example of spot zoning. My concern about the public facilities zoning district is this: is that can it be applied to private property? Because if it can be applied to private property against the will of that property owner, then it could affect that property's value. If there is an undeveloped land that some future board gets their eye on and says, we want to make that a park, and that property owner is holding it for generations to someday develop it the way they want to, can the public facilities, is that only applicable to public land or property? That's a that's a, a very <coughs> key clarification because private recreation, which was a whole different issue, can be applied to private land as well, and th that has issues. If public facility applies only to publicly owned property, then um, that that's a lot different than applying it to someone who has paid for that land. Parks are usually. <coughs> Park properties, Salado is very unique in that up until a couple of years ago, the village of Salado owned absolutely zero park land. Every park we had was, was privately done. Pace Park. Publicly owned and operated. Yeah. Pace Park was private land. Um, Serena Park was private land. Now it's owned by the city itself. So th that, that carries a different kind of connotation. I just wanted to be sure of that. Thank you, Chair. This is the last call for anyone who's wishing to speak. May the minutes reflect that it is seven minutes after eight. Mayor, a quick point of clarification. I've heard a lot about this as instant money, and, and if it gets on that, it enhances the city's position in seeking money. Because when, when you go after grant funding, the funders want some assurance that that property is going to remain a public facility. Uh, and one of the ways you can give them comfort is showing that it's zoned properly. The other one is that you have a public dedication of that. So, and we'll get into public dedications at a future date, hopefully, with both of those facilities. because. The beauty of public dedications is the only way publicly dedicated parkland can change, zoning or not, is if there's a public vote. So they're not in that position yet. Soon, hopefully, we'll, we'll be at a point where they're truly protected. This is the first step. Okay. I'll entertain a motion, please. I move we designate Serena Park as a public facility. With a park. With a park, yes. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Discussion, please. <clears throat> I think it's good business to place a entity in a position to to apply and to qualify for more funds as opposed to more funds from the taxpayer. The possibility, the real possibility seems to me to be there. If we don't resume it, the possibility seems to be absent. That's my primary reason for my motion. Other discussion, please. I stick by my position that uh, we're still uh, in a rush to do this when uh, we could just hold off for a few months until the uh, comprehensive plan is a little bit more solidified. I would ask the board to just put this uh, action also on the table for the next 
Accept and approve the report as presented by Sergeant Hills. Yes, sir. Second. Second. Discussion, please. Question. Question has been called. All in favor, raise your hand. Opposed, likewise. Passes. B. Discuss and consider possible action regarding a proposed concept plan and associated variance requests relating to minimum <coughs> lot size for approximately 54 acres, three-phase residential subdivision to be located at the northeast corner of the intersection of Royal Street and Smith Branch Road. Mayor, as we pointed out earlier, this particular item has been pulled from the agenda the recommendation of staff. We're going to be meeting with the property owner to go through several issues that uh, we have concerns about, several issues that have been raised, uh, and we hope to put this item on the agenda for consideration at your next regular meeting, which will be the 21st. Okay. Consider it full. Discuss and receive. Discuss and consider possible action regarding the selection <coughs> of a firm to provide management, <coughs> operation, and maintenance services for the village of Salado Wastewater System. John? Mike? Can we do that now? You can step out. Do I need to explain? Yes, please. Uh, Don, uh, the company that I'm currently uh, working with as a contract with uh, Jacobs uh, 
slash CH to and uh, as such, I'm a subcontractor for that company, and I would uh, like to recuse myself from this activity. City Secretary, please make sure that the minutes not only not only excuses him, but also the reason. Do I get to go home? Yeah. <laughs> not, not that the horse <laughs> crackers. <laughs> Uh, Mayor, members of the board, uh, you have before you tonight a, uh, a summary sheet that, that kind of outlines where we've been over the last few weeks. 